Welcome everybody to the first in the Tuesday at 2 informal masterclass series that has been uh, hosted by our organization, Wastewater Education 501c3. At this point, I'm going to turn off my video to conserve bandwidth. And our presenter for today is Victor D'Amato. He is a senior engineer, as you will see, from uh, Tetra Tech. And uh, at this point, Vic, I would like to turn it over to you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. I'll move on to first slide here. Uh, the title of the presentation today is New Concepts for uh, Rural, Urban, and Suburban Water Reuse uh, Using Distributed Systems. And I use uh, water reuse uh, fairly broadly here including everything from aquifer recharge through subsurface or surface dispersal to um, more intentional reuse like uh, for uh, toilet flushing, irrigation, and so forth. Um, and you'll see plenty of those examples and concepts um, as we move along. Um, hopefully uh, <coughs> the slides are, are keeping up with your screens there. If not, uh, maybe put a little note in the chat room to slow down, but I've uh, moved on to the presentation outline. Um, again, kind of focusing on uh, what might be considered new or emerging uses for decentralized systems in um, traditional and, and also non-traditional um, areas, so um, including everything from rural to suburban to urban. So I'll start out um, introductory by talking about issues affecting the sustainability of our water infrastructure with a focus on the water energy nutrient nexus or connection. And I added nutrient to that uh, afterwards. We've heard, a lot of us have heard about the water energy connection, but um, I think nutrients are an important part of that, and we'll, um, we'll talk about that, and, and particularly relevant for these types of systems or any kind of wastewater management system. And then talk about or introduce some of the triple bottom line sustainability benefits uh, associated with distributed systems. Then I will introduce the uh, Water Environment Research Foundation, or WERF for short, uh, project entitled When to Consider uh, Distributed Systems in an Urban and Suburban Context, and give you a number of uh, single slide case study summaries that show some of these new um, applications for decentralized systems in action and kind of get into why they were successful, what were some of the decision making um, elements behind them and so forth. And then I'll wrap up with another um, product of this uh, project, which is a decision support tool for, you know, intended for communities to use to make more informed um, water infrastructure decisions, as well as a whole host of supporting tools that have been developed um, by this research collaborative over the past uh, decade or so. And I'll introduce what I mean by that research collaborative uh, when we get to uh, the end there. But, but certainly introducing a lot of uh, tools that uh, you may be familiar with some of them, some of them you may not be, but hopefully at the end of this presentation you will know what's better, what's available, and better how to access those things. So we're going to start off here really big picture um, and look at sort of the history of wastewater and water management. Um, you may be surprised to hear based on this slide that, that a lot of, even today, our water management systems reflect the sort of engineered storage and conveyance network concepts that were really developed 2,000 some years ago by the, in the Roman era. Um, this involved developing water storage facilities, um, transporting water to where it was needed via aqueducts or, you know, uh, rudimentary pipelines, and using gutters and sewers to basically drain wastewater and stormwater away from civilization, um, even then recognizing the uh, potential public health impacts of, uh, of dirty water. But we still really, um, the backbone of a lot of our uh, large centralized systems today really still rely on a lot of these same engineered storage and conveyance networks. Um, and this, this model simply, you know, um, uh, this, uh, um, pretty rudimentary model served um, as, as the backbone for our systems until the last century when with more and more population becoming closer and closer to our water and wastewater started to see more of the effects of water quality um, both in terms of environmental health as well as public health or waterborne disease. So we added sort of end of pipe or um, uh, uh, 
um, water quality treatment to our water supply and wastewater systems. And then more, more recently, perhaps the paradigm that we're in now is trying to get a handle on some of these uh, more dispersed sources of pollution, also called non-point source pollution, generally with the focus there being stormwater management and, and agricultural land use kinds of uh, controls. The new paradigm that you'll hear, hear me mention a few times today is, uh, is sort of an evolving thing that a lot of us are thinking about basically shifting our, our typical way of doing business from a, a once through use, single use kind of concept where we you know, treat uh, wastewater and dispose of it as a waste to more of a multi-use uh, concept with, with an emphasis on fully capturing the value of the resources in our water and wastewater. Um, and this shift, uh, as you can see there, involves an integration of land use and water management to basically attempt to manage water-related resources in a closed loop, which basically means development occurring in a manner, manner that generates zero waste through uh, more uh, resource uh, recovery and recycling. And you'll hear those concepts repeated throughout this presentation. Okay, so this is a quick contrast of our existing water management practices in the U.S. and then some of the characteristics of the new approaches that we'll be discussing during this presentation. Um, our existing uh, water management practices generally rely on uh, highly specialized single-purpose treatment, um, large piping networks feeding centralized treatment plants that are often segregated from the community, kind of an out-of-sight, out-of-mind approach, and oftentimes even located in areas that are uh, not really benefiting from that, uh, the water treatment capabilities. Um, and, and basically just overall kind of a linear design and extractive resource type of approach. We extract water, we treat it once um, for potable use to, to pretty high standards for potable use, use it once, um, and then treat it as wastewater and dispose of it generally after a single use. Um, the focus of this presentation is on how decentralized systems can support a new paradigm of water management where water infrastructure can be multifunctional and integrated into landscapes and buildings. And you see these um, three uh, photos at the top here showing um, this is a wastewater system serving this facility here, um, an attached growth uh, system with vegetation in it. This is kind of a polishing uh, pond for a, a centralized uh, wastewater treatment plant in Florida, kind of a, more of an ecological um, discharge um, that also has some other benefits by enhancing um, habitat and restoring what was a degraded wetland there. And then a stormwater system here is a green roof in a highly uh, urbanized area. Um, a lot of these systems uh, that, that we'll talk about um, are more integrated in terms of the recovery and reuse of resources in wastewater, and the primary resources there are water, of course, um, but also nutrients and energy. Uh, systems that um, are more restorative in terms of their water management approach, in other words, um, systems that help restore local hydrologic cycles by recharging aquifers and um, uh, enhancing uh, ecosystem benefits, and ultimately uh, systems that are more adaptive and resilient to the multiple changes that are, uh, we're faced with as water managers. So let's step back for a moment and look at some of those challenges uh, that, that water managers are facing today. We've probably seen something like this before, um, uh, just indicating just how scarce uh, available freshwater resources are on what would generally be considered a water-rich planet. Um, the global freshwater resource available for human use represents about a half percent of the total water on the planet, and most of that uh, available water, as you can see uh, in this uh, diagram to the, to the right, is, uh, is stored in, in deep uh, groundwater aquifers, making them uh, you know, fairly expensive sources to try to uh, develop um, because of the pumping costs associated with uh, those deep aquifers. Um, and then, of course, uh, we also know that of those available sources that are on the surface, you know, surface waters or um, uh, more surficial aquifers, a lot of those are um, impaired, creating you know, kind of a um, constraints from, from the other side of the resource spectrum. 
another uh, slide here to show just how uh, scarce water resources are, um, particularly in certain areas of the country. This just shows um, how much water each county, um, those are the, the boundaries that you see there, county boundaries, but how much water each county in the U.S. With, withdraws as a percentage of the water uh, recharge due to precipitation, so kind of a overall assessment of the sustainability of water management by county. And dark green um, in this uh, figure uh, represents withdrawal of zero to one percent of the recharged water, so you know fairly sustainable there. While dark red, um, the darkest red color you see there, the darkest color, uh, represents withdrawal of over 500 percent of the water available via precipitation. So this shows that in quite a few parts of the U.S., um, including some of those areas that are growing the fastest, uh, existing water withdrawals already uh, significantly exceed uh, water recharge. And you can see, you know, even some of those counties are you know, generally uh, in places that we would consider fairly water rich in the East um, and Midwest, in addition to the, uh, the ones that are probably more obvious in uh, uh, the West Coast and uh, Southwest. Now, it turns out that much of those withdrawals that we saw in the last slide are actually related to energy development with cooling for thermoelectric power plants being the single largest uh, water withdrawal sector. And with power plants, a lot of that water is evaporated, so it's kind of put back into the hydrologic cycle, but in a way that makes it more difficult to um, recover those resources. But then a lot of it is also discharge, which makes those withdrawals not necessarily consumptive. In other words, that water is still available for use as a, as a resource. But clearly we can see here that energy and water are very closely related. Um, producing water, or producing energy requires water and providing water services, whether it's uh, providing potable water uh, for end uses or, of course, uh, wastewater uh, management all requires the input of energy. So the connection between these resources is something called the water energy nexus. And if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, I actually kind of added uh, nutrients onto that, um, the water energy nutrients nexus, because in fact, they are all three um, intimately interrelated and nutrients are such a big issue in terms of wastewater management because nutrients are often thought of as a pollutant, um, which they are in a lot of water bodies, but nutrients also are a really critical resource for agriculture, food production, and so forth. And um, they are recoverable from wastewater and we'll see that um, recovering nutrients um, can be uh, uh, a real key sustainability um, um, element of uh, sort of 20th, 21st century uh, water systems. Um, but again, because you know these new these resources are so closely linked together, the limits on one resource um, affects the other. So, as water management professionals, why do we really need to care about energy? Um, we saw that you know energy. Um, uh, development uh, requires water, um, or it certainly requires water withdrawals and, and to some extent uh, consumes water. Um, but, but even more compelling, particularly if you're a utility manager or uh, something of that nature, um, is the, the fact that uh, producing water services, again, you know, provide, tr treating water for potable use or treating wastewater requires energy and that energy costs money. And particularly in recent years, our energy supply has become increasingly volatile as, as sort of the easy to develop energy supplies uh, start to, uh, to get used up. Um, the uh, price of, of getting new energy supplies becomes more volatile. Likewise, as we start to use up some of the easier uh, water supplies, um, the energy that might be required to treat some of these or to extract and to treat some of these uh, more marginal uh, supplies also goes up. So energy is just becoming uh, more and more of a driver in terms of decision making uh, for water management. And it's not just from the uh, financial side, but of course energy use also has climate change implications and that's 
uh, both from the control side, that is uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, but also from the adaptation side, uh, that refers more to changes in water availability, which not only uh, includes the overall amount of water available, but also the timing of available water. And in a lot of areas of the U.S., um, particularly where we are here in the southeast, um, the, the thought is that the overall amount of, of precipitation over the course of a year will be roughly the same, plus or minus, you know, some margin of, uh, of error there, but that the timing will be uh, different with more uh, intense uh, rainfall coming in in uh, sporadic kinds of storm events. And that obviously has pretty significant implications on how water is managed overall. So uh, let's get into some of the, the deep, dig down into some of the details here. Uh, this uh, table gives the uh, energy consumption intensity associated with various um, sectors of the water supply and treatment, um, wastewater management, uh, irrigation, um, as well as end uses of water, so the overall kind of water uh, sector. But life cycle water-related energy use, um, and this is from 2007, uh, was estimated to be at least 521 million megawatts per year, which represents about 13% of the country's total energy consumption. And you can see here that uh, the majority of that energy use was actually related to those end uses that I mentioned, and specifically water heating, um, which is actually the, the single largest um, water-related energy demand. But if you look up at the water supply and treatment, um, you'll see that public and private wastewater management um, has some of the highest impacts. And in fact, wastewater management represents about 14% of the total water-related energy use and about 16% of the carbon emissions. Um, overall, uh, water and wastewater management have been estimated to be responsible for about 4% of the nation's energy consumption. So let's look at the energy implications of water infrastructure in a little more detail. Um, each element of our water infrastructure systems require uh, energy from developing a supply to moving it and uh, treating it to potable standards or, or whatever standards are, um, are applicable to heating it, uh, again, um, what, I, what we call end uses. And then, of course, on the other side, to treating the resulting wastewater and disposing or reusing the effluent. Although the ranges are wide, um, you can see here that uh, some of the highest uh, intensities are associated with conveyance and treatment. Um, and in addition to these kind of uh, well-defined recurring um, energy uh, demands, which are pretty easy to measure, we also need to consider other embedded energy demands, such as the energy that goes into developing a water supply or constructing and installing a system. Um, and secondary energy impacts. For example, uh, traditional sewer line extensions can sometimes cause unplanned development that increases traffic, increases commute times, results in lost productivity, as well as additional um, gasoline usage. So just some of those kind of more hidden um, energy costs are also can be very important. On the positive side, energy in various forms can be recovered from wastewater. Um, there's a question on the chat board about um, data on energy use and BOD reduction in wastewater treatment, and I'm going to get into a little bit of that um, in subsequent slides so we can circle back, that, back around to that um, at the end of the presentation if I don't cover it adequately here. But, but the bottom line is, yes, there's some pretty decent data out there on energy intensity of various um, types of uh, treatment processes for reducing um, organics. So the results of uh, the recent NACWA survey, which is basically the uh, organization representing the major water, uh, wastewater utilities, um, but they also show, uh, consistent with the table in the previous slide, that most of wastewater utilities' energy use is associated basically with moving water within the plant. That's this. Uh, in plant pumping here, as well as that BOD reduction, the major biological treatment, which is aeration. Um, now, it's really important here to remember that even uh, this in plant pumping are essentially conveyance costs, but they're just the costs associated with conveying water within the plant. 
when you factor in the conveyance costs associated with um, large collection systems, multiple lift stations, and so forth, you can bet that that number is going to be very high and, and, and probably in almost all cases um, the dominant driver um, in those large systems uh, energy uh, use profile. And this provides a really good example um, in the state of California on the effects of conveyance demands on energy intensity. Um, the water en supply energy footprint in uh, Northern California, which is on the right, is more than twice that of, uh, I'm sorry, in Southern California is more than twice that in Northern California with pretty much all of that increase associated with conveyance because in Southern California, water is pumped from the Sierra Nevada mountains um, uh, long distances and conveyed long distances for both agriculture as well as uh, potable supply. So from this, it should be pretty obvious that if we're going to build more resilient, energy efficient water infrastructure systems, um, optimizing those conveyance and uh, treatment attributes is really critical. And of course, this is being recognized. Um, energy management is already a significant issue for many utilities, and there's a lot of good work being done to better manage um, energy demands associated with water infrastructure. As you can see here, the, uh, the current focus is primarily on uh, water efficiency, so using less water requires less treatment, obviously less pumping and so forth, so there's a pretty direct correlation there between uh, water processed and uh, energy use um, and increasing reuse uh, opportunities. Again, less water to be treated to potable standards means, means less or to higher standards means less energy used. Um, a lot of focus on optimizing the operation of equipment, both by retrofitting with more, you know, newer uh, types of equipment that are more energy efficient, as well as improving the operation of existing equipment through smart control systems and things of that nature, um, turning blowers off, for example, when the you know, DO reaches a certain point uh, in an activated sludge system. And then there's um, been some work, it's not completely, uh, um, it's a little bit outside of the box that we're talking about, but implementing renewables and treatment plants. In a lot of cases, they're, because it's such a, a big open area at a centralized plant, solar arrays are being used. But also there is, of course, work on recovering biogas from uh, usually from um, the biosolids portion of the, uh, the wastewater treatment uh, plant and, and recovering and reusing that energy. But as you probably can anticipate, I'm going to focus more on how decentralized systems are being used to advance these more emerging um, energy optimization efforts, including configuring waste, uh, water systems to most efficiently deliver services to end users. This uh, configuration is something that's sometimes called the system architecture, and we'll um, show a slide on that in a bit. Uh, opening up new opportunities for recovering resources like water, nutrients, and energy from wastewater, and uh, along those same lines, optimizing reuse opportunities by only treating water to the level that's needed for the use or something that's uh, listed there as a fit-for-purpose treatment. So as I implied at the start of the presentation, it's not just water and energy, but nutrients, which are uh, critically important waste-related resources that can be recovered and reused. Um, so for, for one thing, production of inorganic fertilizers to provide nutrients for agriculture um, is a very energy intensive, or in most cases, is a very energy intensive um, process. Um, for another, um, even though nutrients are often considered a problem with respect to water quality, it turns out that some nutrients are becoming scarce. Um, phosphorus is a great example of a resource that could be efficiently recovered from waste treatment systems, but which we now generally dispose of after a single use. Um, again, getting back to that sort of conventional resource extraction paradigm. And the implications of this, this single-use approach is that we're literally running out of phosphorus, maybe not in our lifetimes, but um, as you can see there, the, some of the estimates, uh, 60 to 150 years. Um, that varies depending on the, the research you read. Um, and this is a really significant problem since phosphorus is absolutely um, 
required to produce food. There's no viable replacement, and there's really no easy way to recover it once it's basically discharged to surface waters and makes its way into the sediment or, you know, on downstream out into the, you know, larger surface waters or the ocean. Um, so you may have heard the saying that water is the next oil, and that's a good one, but some people are actually saying that it's phosphorus um, rather than water that's the next oil. So with that introduction, let's talk a little bit about distributed systems uh, and their sustainability attributes. Uh, the concept of dis distributed infrastructure as a key sustainability element, as you probably know, has been embraced uh, in stormwater management where we're generally looking at management and often beneficial reuse um, close to the source using what we would consider low impact design principles or best management practices. Uh, for wastewater systems, very similar, basically talking about integrating smaller scale systems um, with larger systems. So what this usually turns out to be is more decentralized approaches being used within sort of traditional or semi-traditional centralized management frameworks, responsible management. This involves, again, integrating a range of system scales from on-lot kind of single building to, uh, you know, small clusters, large clusters or neighborhood systems, all the way out to centralized systems, which are still applicable, of course, for um, various purposes. And we'll see actually examples of how these smaller systems are being integrated in with uh, the centralized infrastructure in a way that adds value to the whole system. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, about some of the triple bottom line drivers for and uh, benefits of distributed systems versus uh, more conventional approaches. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time on energy, so efficiency is certainly um, a critical one. Uh, distributed systems can provide great efficiency advantages over traditional approaches. I talked about system architecture, and these two uh, provide good examples of more of a traditional approach, um, extending sewer line even to, you know, out of the way areas, perhaps not the most efficient thing to do versus a distributed approach, which still has our centralized plant feeding the, you know, the, or uh, serving the uh, um, critical areas, uh, urban areas and more dense areas. Um, but also relies on cluster systems and on-site systems for those more out of the way places. Um, so obvious efficiency advantage um, is the pro proximity of decentralized systems to wastewater sources as well as reuse areas. Decentralized systems are being um, used to make urban uh, water reuse retrofits more feasible and less disruptive. The typical way that, um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about a centralized uh, water reuse system, getting the large piping networks and so forth into um, built out urban areas can be very almost infeasible because of the uh, uh, disruption that it causes as well as the costs just for the, the piping networks and depth of burial and so forth. Um, so neighborhood scale systems in some cases um, can be used to provide those services um, more efficiently and more cost effectively. Um, source control, for example, separate management of gray water, black water, and even what some people call yellow water or, or urine separation, which is actually a really good and efficient way to recover nutrients, um, but those things are decentralized approaches. Source control has to be done at the decentralized scale. Again, um, they can really make the whole overall system and, and particularly the treatment side uh, more cost effective and efficient. And there's been a lot of development of technologies that um, enhance the control and management of smaller systems, like smart control systems that allow a single operator to, to uh, monitor uh, multiple dispersed systems. Again, uh, water reuse or uh, resource recovery systems um, at multiple scales, not only large centralized scale, but also down to individual sites and neighborhood scale systems. And green systems that basically mimic natural processes tend to be uh, more energy efficient, um, use a small amount of energy, and can be better integrated into uh, facilities. So now let's look at uh, the energy costs associated with a variety of decentralized systems. You can see here um, how 
systems that uh, used um, more attached growth processes are on the lower end of the scale, and this is basically um, it's sort of a strange units used here, but basically this shows for uh, each one of these systems um, their energy use or energy consumption in uh, in, a, in dollars per gallon. So on the left hand side of the graph, we're talking about lower um, energy use systems. And the take home message here is a lot of what we see on the right hand side are forced aeration systems, suspended growth, um, oxidation ditches, uh, act, basically activated sludge process where you're having to pump oxygen in or air in um, tend to be more energy intensive than the more passively aerated systems that are actually pretty common for decentralized systems, uh, particularly where you have a pretty good foot size footprint to, to fit these systems in. So there's actually very few uh, studies on the energy demands associated with decentralized versus centralized approaches for a given area. So we took a very rough cut at the, uh, the potential energy demands associated with a variety of different decentralized water reuse systems um, for a presentation that I gave at the annual Water Reuse Foundation uh, Symposium last year. So we basically um, conceptually developed five model reuse systems, again, decentralized reuse systems, using some combination of the unit processes um, and associated energy demands that you see listed in that table. Um, the systems range from standard septic tank drain field systems to recirculating media filters with disinfection and pressurized distribution of effluent for reuse. As you can see here, some major um, components of decentralized systems, including the septic tank, um, as well as gravity sewer, um, and gravity flow filters um, use zero energy on their own. Um, there is some power draw associated with recirculating um, treated effluent or uh, through the system um, to a recirculating sand filter or media filter, um, and those are captured here as well. And if I can find slide 20. And this just shows the results of that um, rudimentary analysis. So using those unit processes, kind of grouping them in you know, normal configurations, we estimated the energy demands associated with um, several uh, decentralized reuse systems. Here we're calling a conventional gravity system, basically a reuse system um, because it is recharging aquifer, you know, being a little bit generous there, but all the way up to uh, pressure sewer system, um, feeding, recirculating, filtration, and uh, uh, UV disinfection, which could be designed to have, you know, pretty much unlimited um, uh, reuse applications and estimated the energy uh, intensity associated with those different systems. And we didn't have a perfect comparison, but there is, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of data on the energy intensity associated with wastewater treatment sort of more generically. And uh, I just chose this range. Um, and I think 1500 is probably about the minimum that you'll see. Um, that's kilowatt hours per million gallons for conventional activated sludge treatment. Um, that's actually pretty low for that. So again, it's a pretty rough analysis, but it does show at least that we're in the ballpark. And um, I think you can start to see some of the advantages with just getting away from you know, pumping uh, wastewater long distances and, and reuse uh, or reclaimed water long distances to be reused. So closely related to energy efficiency, we also want to close the loop, as I mentioned, on waste-related uh, resource cycles and sort of leverage the connections between land use and water management. So for water, that means looking at wastewater, stormwater, drinking water, and reclaimed water, all within sort of an integrated uh, framework, which might be a watershed-based framework, for example. Um, I should also add that, um, look, that, that natural uh, water resources are also part of that equation, um, aquatic ecosystems as well as supplies, be they groundwater or surface water. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it means recycling nutrients and wastes um, to support agriculture and food production, and again, getting some energy benefit by offsetting conventional fertilizers. 
and it means recovering energy from wastes, again, to offset um, uh, more costly imported sources, costly from, from various perspectives. So if we design around what, what some people call an integrated resource management or IRM kind of approach, instead of costly wastewater treatment plants, we could have multi-purpose revenue generating resource recovery plants. And then finally, economics is of course important. Distributed approaches can have dramatic economic advantages. Uh, traditional water infrastructure projects are often defined by the community by their large costs. That's the first thing people talk about. And particularly when, uh, as we're seeing for the last few years, um, the projections for usage and for being able to pay for these big projects hasn't really been coming in terms of uh, in terms of growth and um, projected you know water demand increases. So you have financing and debt service associated with these projects that can be really crippling communi to communities, again, particularly if those revenues aren't realized because of a downturn in the economy. So what we're seeing is these distributed approaches uh, as a contrast allowing for a variety of adaptive phasing and funding approaches. One example is where systems, um, maybe neighborhood scale systems, for example, are funded by a developer that then turns them over to a water utility for operation. Um, again, we're seeing new models for delivering these services, including you know, some companies that have really embraced it and, and do design, build, operate. Um, a lot of times we'll see, probably more so than for conventional uh, sewering systems, uh, innovative partnerships involving the, the public sector, the private sector, and even um, non-government entities, uh, community entities, and so forth. Um, the validity of this approach has been recognized uh, at the federal level. Um, clean water stimulus funding um, back in, I guess it was 2008 now or 2009, the, the uh, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it specifically included decentralized wastewater systems in the 20% of that budget that was allocated towards what they call green projects, um, basically environmentally superior projects. And we've seen the language that was in the Recovery Act basically translate into um, uh, the 2010 and 2011 state revolving fund guidelines. So basically, EPA with that money that goes to states is encouraging them to um, give pr press, uh, priority to um, quote green projects of which decentralized is categorically included. It does vary by state, but I would encourage you if you are in the United States to check with your state SRF people and see um, what kind of opportunities are available. So. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I'm going to go over some case studies, and this will sort of be the introduction here. Um, these came as the result of a, a project that we recently completed for WERF, again, the Water Environment Research Foundation, basically focused on these emerging uses for distributed uh, systems as an alternative to more traditional approaches, uh, sewering approaches. So objectives of the research were to identify appropriate examples that could be used as case studies, really try to delve into the critical path details and decision-making processes that made these case studies happen. Of course, look at the results and how they compared with, you know, the, the premise for, for doing such a project. And most importantly, setting forth that information in a way that provides a resource to, uh, to other communities uh, facing these kinds of decisions. Um, we'll see a little bit more on both of the, the products that are listed here, but basically each case study has a multi-page summary associated with it. That's kind of a standalone PDF file that you can print out and pass out or whatever you know you wanted to do, just use it for reference, as well as a series of white papers that kind of consolidate the, the lessons learned and then um, a multi-criteria decision analysis tool that we'll uh, hopefully have a chance to walk through towards the end of the, today's presentation. Put the website up there and we're going to try to uh, take a look uh, just at what's available on the website and just show you how to access that as well. So this just uh, shows uh, a list of the case studies and we kind of split them into three major categories that you see uh, bolded there on the left. Um, 
uh, just different ways that these distributed approaches are being implemented um, in communities. Mostly in the United States, we looked at, but we also had a, a panel member um, who was from Australia. So there's some Australian case studies and actually one from uh, Canada as well. Um, the applications include, as I mentioned earlier, you know, site scale, on, on site, on lot scale, through the sort of neighborhood slash community scale, all the way up to larger utilities who are implementing some of the same approaches to make their operation, to optimize their operations. So at the building or site scale, uh, we're seeing systems integrated into buildings and landscape designs, uh, resource recovery and reuse um, within facilities and multifunctional systems um, that also serve uh, some recreational or aesthetic purpose or, or to educate the public or um, uh, uh, um, educate school kids. Uh, a number of what we call independent communities have embraced the distributed approach in order to essentially maintain their independence, both fiscally by not sort of connecting to and be uh, fiscally tied to their neighbor's uh, sewer system, um, and also to preserve the character of the community um, by discouraging unplanned development that sometimes comes with um, public sewer. And then, we're, as I mentioned, we're seeing an increasing number of more traditional water and wastewater uh, utilities um, pursuing distributed approaches. These include professional management of cluster systems for development that's outside of the core service area for the utility. So again, kind of putting the treatment where the treatment's needed rather than taking everything back a long distance to a centralized plant, as well as sewer mining and satellite treatment systems where looking at using these smaller advanced treatment systems to provide um, a localized source of reclaimed water. And a lot of times, um, particularly for this, the mining and, and satellite systems, those systems are actually physically interconnected with the main sewer system to provide backup um, or for handling residuals from the treatment process. So um, all of those case studies are accessible from the website. Again, we'll take a look at the website in a bit, but I'm just going to give a very brief overview of about 10, um, just one slide each, just to give you kind of a flavor of the different types of approaches and hopefully covering sort of the spectrum to uh, um, <clears throat> pretty represent uh, a good representation of what's being done. So starting out sort of at the, the site scale and working our way up, um, People are, uh, as I mentioned, incorporating decentralized reclamation and reuse systems into green buildings. This example is for a commercial building that um, happens to be the headquarters for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. So we would consider this, I guess, a suburban approach um, just outside of the, the downtown Annapolis, but still within the service area. Um, and their local uh, distributed approach really focused on water efficiency to the maximum extent uh, possible. Um, they basically use waterless composting toilets for water conservation, and which also allows for some recycling of carbon and nutrients by using that compost product as a soil amendment. Um, and by focusing you know, specifically on extreme water conservation, they were able to limit their wastewater generation to only 80 gallons per day. And this is for an 80 uh, person, you know, full-time 80 person uh, office building. So pretty amazing one gallon per day per person. Um, continuing on the sort of green building front, um, get at the sort of single building scale or, or you know, single campus scale, sort of an institutional example. This is a school in suburban uh, DC, Washington DC area. Um, and in this example, they've integrated smart systems for monitoring their water management as well as educating um, uh, pupils as well as visitors. And um, you can see they monitor their um, the, the recycled uh, water levels as well as their wastewater levels and their, their water levels. Um, the design is really integrated into the landscape. You can see kind of a rendering here, um, but it includes a series of terraced construction, uh, constructed wetland cells that provide multiple benefits, not only treatment, but also restoration of hydro hydraulic cycle components um, through evapotranspiration and sort of enhancing the habitat uh, functions of the site. Um, reclaimed water is, is recycled for toilet flushing as well as for cooling towers. And uh, I mentioned the uh, uh, stormwater system 
um, which also provides uh, reclaimed water. Uh, the solar, you may have heard about this one, a really good example of a, an urban, highly urban uh, water re decentralized water reuse approach. Um, this is a mixed use development uh, in, in uh, Battery Park in Manhattan, so really dense urban landscape. And it's one of about a dozen uh, similar uh, systems, building scale systems in the Battery Park redevelopment. And they all, I believe, use uh, uh, MBR, membrane bioreactor system. In this case, the uh, MBR is uh, built into, let me get to the right page, it's built into the um, basement of the facility. Um, they also have a uh, green roof for stormwater harvesting. So again, another example, stormwater and wastewater are both uh, integrated into the system. Um, and reclaimed water uses include toilet flushing, uh, again, uh, HVAC system cooling, outdoor irrigation, and in fact, in some of the newer systems in Battery Park, the reclaimed water is being used for laundry. Moving up just a little bit here in scale, Dockside Green is a uh, water-centric redevelopment that treats wastewater on site to several different qualities depending on the reuse application. You might remember from an earlier slide, I called this fit-for-purpose treatment. Again, another way just to make things more efficient. Don't over-treat, which requires you know, more energy than you need for the use. Um, also, interestingly, it includes a, a pond and stream complex, which are not only treatment um, polishing, if you will, and conveyance components of the wastewater system, but are also integrated into the landscape um, as site amenities. And in fact, the properties that are located along, I guess you could call it the waterfront, um, generate higher revenues. So a really good way to you know, have that interesting system element and functional system element pay for itself or perhaps even um, increase the value of the property. Another important point here is that uh, Dockside Green, and, and this is a good um, uh, integration of water and energy, but um, they have a co-located gasification plant for converting uh, treated sludge from the wastewater treatment process to energy for the facility. So moving more into the kind of neighborhood here, scale, uh, Kurumban Eco Village is a residential development in uh, Queensland, Australia, completely off the grid, disconnected from the public water system. Potable uh, water is supplied. The original supply is rainwater, which is, um, and the supply is augmented by a non potable water reuse system. Um, Corumbin, like uh, Sidwell Friends School, also includes uh, sort of intelligent monitoring systems. Um, so at each home, uh, there's uh, meters for the levels and usage rates of water, um, energy, and, uh, and reclaimed water. Um, <clears throat> And the wastewater is treated to a very high standard um, using uh, a variety of uh, different processes. And it's kind of a semi-centralized system, I guess, more of a cluster uh, system. But the, uh, the, the reuses of that uh, uh, reclaimed wastewater are listed there, toilet flushing, uh, um, irrigation, car, car washing, laundering, and firefighting. So now a little more of a I guess what we could call a more conventional um, type of decentralized approach. Um, Bethel Heights uh, offers a really good example of a community that pursued a distributed approach primarily for those economic reasons that I mentioned. Rather than connecting to an adjacent sewer in uh, another town or building a one large over-designed centralized plant, the city decided to um, do two cluster systems, which are strategically located in areas of growth. And in fact, each of those cluster systems is, is even phased in by using modular um, uh, recirculating media filters to basically accommodate um, increasing demands as the population grows. Um, sometimes this is called a, a just a right size, just in time kind of approach. So again, kind of optimizing capacity as needed um, over time and distributed approaches give you that flexibility. Uh, another important point here is that um, the treated effluent and kind of a reuse component is uh, the uh, drip irrigated in hay fields, which help manage nutrients in this particular watershed. Um, Northeast Arkansas is sort of nutrient enriched area, so the watersheds are generally compromised by nutrients, while 
the southern parts of the state um, agriculturally are deficient in nutrients, so they basically um, in Bethel Heights uh, harvest the hay from the uh, drip irrigation system and ship those nutrients to where they're needed um, in the southern part of the state. So some good um, elements that embody some of the principles that we talked about earlier. Um, Wickford Village's wastewater project came out of a watershed assessment basically driven by concerns about nutrient enrichment of Narragansett Bay. So again, like Bethel Heights, rather than connect to an adjacent sewer system, this community developed a, a pretty robust management program for existing systems. Um, and the resulting management program basically prioritizes prioritizes system management and upgrades by their location. Um, you can see these different districts, um, which are based on their location within the watershed and their proximity to um, surface waters. And basically existing uh, systems in higher risk areas are given preference with respect to uh, grant funding that's available. Um, that money was ceded by the state of uh, Rhode Island. Um, but again, it's prioritized for systems where, you know, they'll be the biggest bang for the buck to advance, uh, to upgrade to advanced treatment. And again, um, a concern there was, you know, a kind of a quaint New England uh, village really didn't want to go and tie to their neighbor's system, wanted to kind of maintain that New England independence as well as, um, you know, really avoid the kinds of overdevelopment that might occur if, uh, if public sewer were widely available. So moving into more traditional utilities, uh, Sydney Water is a large utility in Australia, and they were um, approached by a golf club that was struggling to maintain its greens because of the irrigation restrictions associated with the ongoing or the, the uh, well-publicized drought in Australia. And basically, this uh, facility has public water and sewer service, both you know, mains going um, right by the facility, but no reclaimed water, uh, which would have been very expensive to run a line out to them. So they entered into an agreement with the utility to essentially mine wastewater from the adjacent sewer main, treat it locally um, on site here, and reuse it as needed for, um, for their uh, maintaining their, their important landscapes there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this kind of sewer mining approach, one of the advantages is that you can um, only take as much water as you need for the, the uh, reuse, as well as um, it provides a place to discharge the residuals from the process for, you know, downstream processing by the, uh, the centralized utility which is not really a big deal for them because a lot of the organics have already been removed. So the overall load is being decreased. The organic load is being decreased on Sydney water. Um, Loudoun County, Virginia decided to rely on uh, managed decentralized or cluster systems for extending service to new uh, development outside of their, their centralized service area. The approach there was really um, an int um, was driven by an interest for growth to pay for growth and for development outside of the core city service area um, where core services were available to be guided more by appropriate land use planning and zoning rather than the availability of sewer. So they um, devised a way to provide sewer but in a distributed fashion. Um, so here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as an example where developers design and construct, and construct treatment systems to Loudoun water standards and then turn the, those systems over to the county for ownership and operation. Um, so for subdivisions, residential subdivisions, that's what they do. Um, so Loudoun water, um, you may be familiar with the term uh, responsible management entity, but they operate as a what's called a level five RME for those types of uh, small community systems where they both, they actually transfer owner, the developer transfers ownership to the, the uh, utility to be that responsible management entity and to operate it uh, sustainably. And then for commercial facilities like um, shopping centers, things of that nature, um, the, the owner basically maintains their uh, ownership of the system, but, but Loudon Water will um, operate at what's called a level four RME. Um, kind of even larger scale here, more traditional utility kind of uh, operation. The Lot Alliance is a uh, wastewater and reclaimed water utility serving 
um, Lacey, uh, Olympia, and Tumwater in Washington State. The partner communities and the public went through a very extensive uh, infrastructure planning process and ultimately chose what they call their highly managed option for wastewater infrastructure implementation. And this again embraces that uh, right size, just in time construction. Um, in summary, instead of building a single large over design plan, they're building in these smaller um, increments of capacity. That phasing approach allows uh, the utility to adapt to technological changes as well as water quality standard changes and regulatory changes over time while also um, uh, recovering those, uh, those uh, economic advantages that we talked about in terms of uh, minimizing upfront expenditures and, and debt. The last case study here is actually not one from the WORF project, but I thought it was uh, really relevant. Um, some work we were, we've been doing to support the state of Maryland in implementing the Chesapeake Bay uh, TMDL um, for nutrients specifically, nitrogen specifically, by developing a statewide plan uh, for reducing nitrogen loading associated with some 420,000 existing uh, on-site systems in the state, did a real broad sort of GIS analysis started out doing a uh, what we call a nitrogen loading analysis which basically used various indicators to identify systems that should be uh, higher priorities kind of similar to the Rhode Island example that I just showed um, and then we looked at the location of all of their on-site systems and developed a nutrient reduction analysis that basically rated various approaches for managing nutrients from each of those systems. So the management approaches included professional management or more intensive management of on-site systems that could include um, upgrades to advanced nutrient removal, um, the use of cluster systems for advanced treatment, and uh, connection to nearby public sewers where it's practical and affordable. And that's sort of the key here, I think, is that the state has really integrated their water infrastructure funding program with their smart growth um, planning uh, programs in a way that encourages connecting uh, septic systems to centralized sewers only in really um, highly defined uh, priority funding areas that are really close to those existing uh, service areas while focusing on other management alternatives uh, for septic systems outside of those areas. Again, this is all in a way to sort of integrate water infrastructure with other types of uh, growth planning and to prevent sprawling uh, patterns that they recognize drain state re uh, resources in various ways. So uh, I mentioned that uh, we use these case studies to develop four white papers. Uh, you can see here there's sort of an, uh, we call this kind of the umbrella guide, sort of the overview to the uh, entire project. Um, and then uh, one uh, white paper that specifically focuses on green buildings, um, uh, those types of projects, one that specifically focuses on the kind of independent uh, community, small community, uh, applications and then one that focuses more on the sort of optimization of tra uh, traditional utilities. Um, again, each, uh, each of the white papers actually links to individual case studies that you can see here on one of those pages, the blue uh, underline, um, so you can actually connect to the case studies that relate to that specific white paper. And again, we have the uh, website listed here, which we'll go to in a moment. But before we do that, um, just wanted to uh, kind of introduce another key uh, product of that project, which was in an effort to, uh, to help stakeholders make uh, more informed wastewater infrastructure decisions for their communities, really trying to examine what the decision-making attributes were of those case studies that, that we just went over and, and others. And what we saw there was that from an environmental perspective, a lot of times green building metrics like uh, LEED and related um, types of rating systems or those kinds of values are driving source uh, choices to use low impact uh, approaches at the site scale. While water quality and, and in some cases what watershed management concerns were driving decisions at the broader community scale. I think you saw that in the Maryland example um, and in the Rhode Island example and, and maybe a few others um, that I didn't present. However, we found that there was something missing. There was kind of a general disconnect between these site scale management approaches 
and their watershed scale or water quality, uh, their watershed scale water quality impacts. So we saw a need to sort of connect those things, what we do at the site scale, to how that you know results in real improvements, as well as you know there's kind of a dearth of um, tools that someone can use similar to LEED or other green building rating systems to look at community scale water infrastructure specifically. Um, so basically looking at those things from a larger kind of perspective. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, these alternative approaches that, that I've been talking about are you know, are kind of boutique kinds of uh, cases, kind of one-off types of things rather than widely embraced kind of approaches for distributed systems and that in many cases when these decisions are made, um, the, the cost benefit analysis that's done or the, you know, the sort of low cost um, uh, engineering planning kind of process that's done really just looks at some of the, the very well-defined costs which makes sense, they're pretty easy to get a handle on. <clears throat> but um, there's, there's other things that really need to be factored in, externalities and other sort of tr more triple bottom line um, costs and benefits. And, you know, again, really trying to find a way to start to capture some of those more, shall we say, intangible things into a decision-making framework. And there are some techniques for doing that that are listed there. This was a relatively small project, so it was a piece of a relatively small project, so we took sort of our first steps in developing such a tool um, based on multi-criteria decision analysis, which basically says that the stakeholders using the tool decide what their values are, and that kind of sets up the model, and then you work through the decision based on uh, that set of values, and you'll see sort of how that unfolds. So we called our tool the Decentralized Wastewater Stakeholders Decision Model, and this just kind of shows um, the overall structure of the model and what some of the economic, environmental, and societal triple bottom line factors that are considered. And now um, I'm going to go to the website and see if that – I'm just typing in the link which Dendra had put up, which is – www.worf.org backslash distributed water website. So this is a web page. It's pretty simple, but it at least provides sort of links to all the products of the project that I just mentioned. I should add here that all of this stuff that I'm talking about today is free and publicly accessible because some of the funding um, uh, came from uh, the, the federal government through EPA. Um, so what you see here is just an introduction to the website, to sort of the background of this project, and then links to uh, the different uh, products that were developed, the decision model. If you click on that, you will get a pop-up for uh, opening or saving that Excel-based uh, model. I'm going to cancel that, but I hope Dendra has it up so we can go through it, uh, as well as PDF links for the white papers. Um, if you hit that, you just go down to the case studies themselves, and each one of those is a live link to a PDF file. Um, and then if you click additional resources, you're just brought to the bottom of the page where there's some other useful websites, including EPA's um, website, which has some good resources um, and some other uh, related um, important uh, resources there. In these distributed systems, is there a problem of fog, fog buildup or that fats, oils, and greases and possible black blockages? If so, what to do? And yes, um, fats, oils, and greases can be a huge issue for um, decentralized systems, particularly where you're often um, dispersing the treated effluent to uh, a soil treatment system. To the soil matrix, and if you if you get a significant amount of uh, of those materials out there, you can you can damage or um, destroy essentially a critical part of your system. So it is important, um, you know, in terms of what to do. I think you know the the normal things. Uh, first thing to do is uh, reduce and to prevent. Um, that stuff from getting in the system in the first place. So if it's a restaurant, having appropriate management practices and communicating 
to employees what those are. Um, and then certainly any kind of uh, facility um, that has dedicated food service generally has at least a grease trap, which is pretty oversized uh, tank to cool the food service uh, wastewater enough, hopefully, to um, separate out those fat soils and greases, usually as a floating layer. Um, but there's also a lot of um, stuff that, especially that's being used these days, oils that are passing through these systems in an emulsified state or um, whatever, the more, more liquid types of uh, oils that don't harden up like some of the more traditional butter and lard and stuff like that. So that, that really ties back into the management practices, but definitely um, grease trap would be uh, another form of protection there. There's grease interceptor units that can be used underneath um, the sinks and dishwashers that are going to be generating that material. Um, and then there's the possibility of just using advanced treatment, advanced biological oxygen demand treatment kinds of systems that can get at breaking down some of those materials better and providing overall a, a better quality effluent. Okay. Um, I'm going to say um, Brian and Brian's question okay. is quite lengthy. So let's hold that one for a minute. And I think everybody should be seeing <laughs> okay. the WOOF decision model. If you are, would you use the green check or the red X, please? Just this is the introductory screen that just kind of lays out what the model does and walks through the three steps. Can you click start there? Yes. Do with the decision stakeholder um, spreadsheet. Is to have a follow-up session specifically about this, and we've talked about creating a uh, a mythical, but a hypothetical, but a very real community that has some issues, and using the spreadsheet to basically create a decision model for the community that we've we've decided to christen Lake Bountiful. But uh, if any of you think you have a, a, a typical community that you would like to use as a case study to go through this decision model, by all means contact me off list or, or put me a message in the chat window. And um, let's let's go back to the side. Let me just um, there's one thing here that I did want to go to. This is the uh, screenshot for the objectives. So what you're looking at here on the right side of the screen are the uh, what each section works to. You're really looking to minimize capital costs or minimize operating costs. Are you looking to, commu to meet community economic needs? Because in any decision to go for management or for a community-wide wastewater treatment system, there are, there are basic questions that you do have to ask yourself. And all of your participants should be asking themselves this question too. And I think we've all been involved in communities where at least one of these hasn't really been addressed and you end up with some absolutely devastating community strife. And it really should be, does the community think it needs one? Does the community uh, believe that they can afford it? Uh, are we putting in something new? So we're starting with a brand new education process. Or are we, um, are, are we looking to renovate something that really isn't working? And then the logical thing is how many people are going to pay for this? How many people of the people who can pay for this can afford it? Now, all of those questions are built into this assessment tool. So with that, I am going to end application sharing and go back to uh, Vic. You should be at your decision model I think slide so. sheet. <laughs> okay, go go ahead. Yeah. Okay. As Dender said, yeah, the first screen basically is where the stakeholders set up their objectives or establish their objectives by just putting in a rating of zero to five in each of these broad categories under the triple bottom line of economic, environmental, and societal kinds of issues. And that basically sets up the model so you can see what the weighting is for each one of these broad categories. Hit the button next step, and then you're basically walked through a series of um, 
screens that require the stakeholders to basically decide for each one of these attributes here, what would better meet our community's objectives, a decentralized or centralized approach, and there's some, uh, you can have uh, neutral or, or slightly favoring decentralized, strongly favoring decentralized or centralized, and you just click the appropriate button through this, and this is something that maybe would be best to be facilitated by a, an impartial um, person who can provide some feedback on what some of the considerations are. There are some buttons here that you can click to find out what some of the considerations are. This will just pop up a screen that tells you, you know, more specifically about some of the uh, trade-offs um, with regards to decentralized or centralized approaches under each of these categories. And then eventually you get to the end, which provides basically an answer. It's not the right answer. It's just the answer that your set of stakeholders came up with. Um, we see this tool as, uh, as basically providing a framework for discussions about um, infrastructure planning to be done um, in an open way and a transparent way where the assumptions are pretty well laid out. So we see it kind of being applied more and as Dender mentioned, kind of a work session, a collaborative kind of session um, that basically you know, helps get everyone on the same page with respect to um, their values as well as their assumptions regarding, you know, what uh, what would what best meet uh, community needs under all these different kinds of factors. So let me swing back to where we were. Um, Dedra, yes. if you don't mind, sure. do a little poll here. So um, would you, uh, did Dendra mention what we had in mind here, um, but would you be interested Assuming that we got all the bugs worked out of the system um, in participating in a future webinar that was really focused on working through this tool uh, model. And you can the value <laughs> of the tool. And again, we really should stress this does not take the place of an actual engineering facil facilitated feasibility report. What this does is it starts in plain it was designed for um, community level discussion. It's designed for planning and zoning commissioners, elected officials, um, like from property owners, uh, community groups. It's designed to start with a reality check. I described this once that Yes, if I could afford it, I would love to have a Mercedes-Benz parked in my driveway. But when I start looking at the cost of insurance, the cost of maintenance, the cost of repairing it if it goes into a crash, um, just the cost of upkeep of it, um, I'm probably really happy with my Dodge Ram 4x4 truck out there, which is, uh, makes a lot more sense for me. So using the decision-making tool really allows people to see the true cost of the Cadillac as opposed to thinking about um, what, what can we really afford and what can we really get people to buy into. Okay, so the last couple slides here, um, as you saw in the model, there's a lot of specific questions, fairly detailed questions that communities need to address before they can make these informed infrastructure decisions using a tool like the model. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of resources out there to help communities answer those questions. Um, this project uh, was funded by the uh, Decentralized Water Resources Collaborative, or DWRC, which also um, completed over the last approximately 13 years um, over 70 projects specifically re related to decentralized uh, wastewater. Some of them are more research, some of them are more um, education, uh, some of them are more capacity kind of development um, issues, but a lot of resources are out there. Um, you can see the partner organizations there of which WERF is uh, one. The, uh, the projects that have been uh, funded and completed uh, range from environmental sciences and engineering um, projects. Uh, some examples here are a project that basically, uh, again, creates kind of a model to um, help uh, users figure out what kind of treatment performance they can expect based on different types of soils um, in the soil treatment unit. 
Um, and these are just examples to give you a flavor of what's been done. Um, evaluation of the potential for uh, methane uh, emissions from septic systems. Some work has been done on that front. And an analysis of existing community uh, size decentralized wastewater treatment systems, um, different types of pretreatment units, if you will. Um, there's projects that are more related to management, economics, and policy. Uh, I mentioned uh, responsible management entities, or RMEs. There's some really good guidance about what works, um, how to set up an RME, um, and what you know some of the common concerns are, and so forth. Um, case studies uh, for decision making, so kind of related to the project that we've been talking about. Um, and a project that looked at what some of the barriers are to more widespread use of decentralized wastewater um, technologies and management and how we can overcome those th things through better educational basis in, in uh, college and so forth um, for these systems, which are often neglected, and various other um, uh, ways to overcome those barriers. And then finally, some really specific materials that were created under this program to enhance uh, training and education. There are some model kinds of uh, provider um, training materials for installers, for practitioners of uh, various kinds. Um, there's a nice glossary, which is incredibly long. Um, there's a lot of terms that we use, and a lot of us use different terms for the same things. So I think this has really helped make things more consistent, or at least so that we can understand what the other person from the other state is talking about. Um, and uh, another um, uh, sort of model curriculum for university uh, uh, teachers. So um, another, uh, we sort of wor helped WORF uh, and the DWRC uh, generate sort of the final project uh, associated with this program, which was basically a way to help people figure out where to find the information they're looking for. Um, you can see uh, some of the tools that were developed for that purpose. The matrix basically lists all the projects and what the keywords associated with those projects are and what the um, uh, intended audiences for those projects are and also provides links. There's a fairly extensive uh, frequently asked questions guide. There's some materials that um, stakeholders can use to communicate issues about decentralized systems and about the resources that are available to elected officials and so forth. Um, and again, all of this is available to the public free of charge through several different venues. So now uh, we're going to try it again, and I think it'll work pretty well. Um, www.worf.org.decentralized outreach, and I will copy that and plop it into the chat box. Um, so you can see here another kind of placeholder type website, but it provides easy access to all these different um, tools. Again, the Frequently Asked Questions Guide, a, br a brochure just describing the program and overviewing the projects or the products that resulted from it. This is the matrix. This is a, would be a really good thing to uh, take a look at um, because it provides on a you know pretty condensed version summaries of all these different 70 plus kinds of research uh, projects and, and products. Um, a temp presentation template that can be used and modified for your use for various audiences. And, an eight, and uh, we felt it was important to get a um, communications out to more centralized uh, utilities, uh, more traditional utilities describing some of these new uses for decentralized systems. So there is a video, and Dendra, I'll leave it up to you as to whether we want to play this. It is six minutes, and I know we're running late here. So we could just uh, bypass that and have folks uh, take a look at it on their yeah, own Yeah, I think that um, the, the link is there. Think? I do encourage everyone to go look at that video. It, it's yeah. very, very good. OK. Um, so go back to the whiteboard here. And I really just have my concluding slide. I want to thank you all for bearing 
with me and with us. Glad that we were able to get this in, just being about 15 minutes over time here. But um, there was one question that I can try to address, but certainly if you have any other questions, um, I'd be willing to uh, address those as well. So just feel free to raise. Perspective is BOD reduction ahead of the sewage reaching the treatment plan and opportunity for optimization. What are the critical problems you may see in such endeavors? I think, Brian, and you might have to correct me here, but um, I think you're referring more to the sewer mining type of approach where you're treating wastewater on site, pulling it out of an existing force vein, treating it on site, and then putting the leftovers sort of back in the system where you are kind of shaving off some of that BOD load. Uh, so it's definitely an opportunity for optimization, and we're seeing it, you know, through, sat like I mentioned, satellite systems. Um, that are being used by more, you know, traditional uh, wastewater utilities as well as these sewer mining approaches of pulling off that resource at where it's needed. Um, some of the problems, um, I don't think the problems are, there's really many critical problems to that approach. I think they're pretty solvable. Um, there's, of course, just the engineering associated with it, but maybe the more, um, the institute, I think just more generally, some of the problems associated with all of these new approaches, and we saw this pretty much across the board with the case studies that I mentioned, is just that it's it, the, the um, institutional pathways um, are just not set up to deal with non-traditional approaches, which is why we keep doing the same thing over and over again, because even though they may be really big projects and inefficient projects in some cases, they're pretty easy to get through, the, you know, we, we sort of know how to get them through the regulatory bureaucracy and so forth. So as a general kind of overarching statement, the sort of um, knowing what the, the regulatory pathways and having the sort of institutional kinds of agreements and arrangements in place to make some of these projects happen tends to be the biggest barrier. And I think it's the same if you're talking about a sewer mining project. You know, one, one of the issues with that Sydney water case study was, you know, what kind of, this is kind of the first time they, they went into an agreement with kind of a private company uh, the golf course to take some of their wastewater and you know what kind of agreements are needed there. So there's some legal issues and so forth in terms of liability, um, and then just in terms of the agreement of you know how much water would be taken and and the terms under which uh, residuals would be returned and so. In terms of you know some of the case studies that were part of the work project, uh, I should add that all of the case studies have contact information associated with them. Two that come to mind the uh, Dockside Green, or at least one that comes to mind would be Dockside Green, which was in British Columbia. Um, and there they really are looking at an integrated resource management kind of approach where energy recovery, water recovery, and nutrient recovery are all kind of elements of that. And if you contact the people associated with that project, who I think will be uh, listed on there is maybe Patrick Lucy. Um, he could probably steer you in the right direction in terms of other um, such projects. We've, we've been working more with individual owners at the site scale, um, so not necessarily on, on similar types of projects, nutrient recovery, energy recovery projects at the real small scale, but there hasn't, that's been streamlined in that there hasn't been a, a but already uh, a water or wastewater utility that you know sort of has access to those waste streams. So there's a little more flexibility there. But still a lot of the same issues in terms of regulatory, you know, who approves those systems and so forth. Just to just, uh, go back to Brian's question there at the end, he was looking more, I think, at basic systems for, as you said, ideas for countries that have no capacity at the moment to treat municipal waste. So, I think we're looking more at overseas systems. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting and that, that kind of ties into Philip's question. Um, how successful are these systems in areas of the world where the workforce has little or no education? And I think, um, I think you just have to uh, design approaches or systems 
consistent with the capabilities of the, the community in question. And it's really interesting to me, and I haven't been able to do a lot of sort of follow-up work on it, but how a lot of these principles that we're promoting here in this presentation in terms of resource recovery and reuse have been done for thousands of years and are continue to be done in some of these what we would call less developed areas, but because their, re their resources are so scarce there, there are, you know, really low-tech kinds of approaches for recovering biogas and essentially compost. Um, there's biogas latrines, which basically is a toilet with two compartments where you go in one compartment while the other one kind of digests and kind of alternate um, as you fill them up. But the one that's digesting, it's you know very simple um, biogas collection for use for um, kitchen, uh, uh, you know, um, heat for for cooking. So you know a lot of these things are being done in um, uh, lesser developed areas successfully. Um, but it's, I think when you start getting into advanced treatment and more control systems, then yeah, you have to really think about you know what what are the capabilities of the of the local community in, in accessing replacement parts and things of that nature. So it's really, you know, tailoring the technology to the, the capabilities of the, the population being served. But the, but the overall concepts, as I said, are, are being embraced out of necessity in some of these areas. Are there any other questions before we wrap up for the day? Also, if you are interested uh, in receiving the text transcript, which for some folks that's a nice thing to have because you can put it into your uh, Google Translator or into Babelfish. At this point, I'm going to move on to our last slide here because this really says it all. This is why we're here. This is why we do what we do. This is an amazing image and uh, I did actually put the link to this on our Twitter page and uh, you can find it in various other locations as well. This is a, a picture that was a compilation of all of the images that were taken on one orbit of the International Space Station and then stitched together to redo in high definition the original blue marble in space. And you think of being off this planet and looking back at it and realizing that we, we cannot live without the water. But then, interestingly enough, in the email a notice for this presentation today, there was an amazing piece of scientific and graphic work where all the water in the world was gathered together into a single globe that would fit basically over the state of Utah. So that really puts into perspective exactly what a precious resource this is, and it is finite. We use this slide a lot in our presentations because basically, if you think you're in the business of wasting water and cleaning up wasted water, then we're all in for a world of hurt in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, when people say, are you in the wastewater business? I say, no, I'm in the clean water business. And everybody who's in this room today is almost certainly what I would call a clean water professional. And again, this is our contact information. Um, it would be on the confirmation email. You will all be getting a follow-up email from me. Um, at this point, if anyone has any more questions, now is the time to speak, as they say, or if I ever hold you a piece. Not seeing any, I'm going to end the recording for today. <laughs>